All right, so here is kind of a reminder of what you're supposed to be doing with your brush marks. You need to really wrap your mark around the form. So that's what I'm doing with those Expo markers. I'm showing you where your brush stroke pattern should go. And that's about the length of your brush stroke right there. So about an inch, inch and a half. And it depends on what form you're trying to articulate. Like on that cast shadow there, you should go with kind of an angled stroke but on the pumpkin itself, you want to wrap it around, almost treat it like it was a donut. And then you want to go kind of erratic, almost like confetti in the background, so all these angled lines. I like it when the um, direction of the stroke kind of leads your way, like it guides the eye to the focal point. There are a number of ways to start a painting and there's really no exact right way to, but this is one way of beginning a painting, which is to paint the background first. And our policy is to always work from dark to the midtones to the light, so dark to light. So we're going for a cast shadow and filling that in. Think about the direction of your stroke, trying to mimic or suggest a shadow that's extending out where it goes onto the corn, you would have to curve your shadow a little bit. And you can see I'm drawing a little bit with the paint and then filling it in, making sure to drag my stroke kind of sideways. And you don't want to use a tiny brush for anything that is foreground or background. You want to use a medium or a larger brush for that. When you're working on the foreground area, you want to keep in mind tick marks because that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm just overlapping them until you can't really see the individual mark so much because there's no white of the paper. I'm covering that up with all these little dabs or strokes of paint. And again, short, I'm doing different lengths, right? Like one inch, but then some that are smaller and some that are dotted and getting a variety of marks in place. All right, so in my reference photo, I have a lawn in the background, but I didn't want to paint a lawn again because I did a little bit for the apple. So I decided I'm going to come up with my own creative background. You can do this too. You just want to make sure that your values are still like kind of complementing the rest of the painting. Like here, I'm deciding to go with kind of a kind of a periwinkle blue color. There's a little bit of crimson added to it. And that's to kind of juxtapose against the orange of the pumpkin because the opposite on the color wheel complement of orange is blue or blue violet. You still want to get a gradient in there and it should be all these little ticks of color just like you saw with the background, all these little strokes that lead up to this kind of solid background. Moving on to the pumpkin, it is so important that you work from dark to light. That means you're looking at the form shadow first because we already have the cast shadow on the ground plane, but we're going to that shadow that's on the pumpkin itself. And form shadows, as you remember, are always going to be a soft gradient. It's not going to be an abrupt shift from one value to the next. It's going to be a slow curve into the light. Now you want to paint your pumpkin almost like you're painting on top of like a burger or in my case like it looks kind of like a donut there's an indent in the center this is going to help you with things like painting a face because faces have a lot of curves in them a lot of indents and stuff that bulges out like a cheekbone will bulge out so it'll help you to render other objects as well not just a pumpkin The natural inclination is to want to paint the pumpkin just one hue of orange, but that's not true. If you look at your reference photo, there should be all these little subtle shifts. So here's an up close of the side of the pumpkin that I'm painting, and you can see it's tick marks. It's just a different type of tick marks because I'm curving around the form. There's these little gradients that are occurring within the form shadow alone, but it's not just all one color. It's changing. So it's darker at the bottom and then it gets warmer. There was some white that I needed to add to it. And then it changes as it curves up the form as well. So you're essentially applying tick marks. And the thing about the pumpkin is they have curves on them indents and you want to follow that curvature because it will help you to wrap that stroke around the form which in turn makes it look like it's round. 
and that's the goal, right? It's to get volume in these forms. So it starts off actually looking ugly. You have to be okay with that. Most artwork doesn't look pretty until like midway through or towards the end of the painting process. So just kind of trust this process of going from dark to light. So I'm looking anywhere in that photo reference for a dark spot. Now this one has an indent. It's kind of like a little belly button there. And because it's sucking in, there's a shadow. For this part, I'm going to speed it up so you can see how I'm using those tick marks to really wrap around the form. I am looking for any weird texture stuff and I'm going to try and mimic that. Although it does not have to be perfect because it's a first layer. Remember that's the gift of a first layer is you're just trying to cover the white of the paper, but you still want to pay attention to value. You would never just want to paint that pumpkin like only two hues, which means two colors, because that would be very flat and it would be like a child's painting. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying the goal really is to create an object that has mass or volume. So ideally, I want this to look like something that's 3D. Remember how we talked about having hard edges and soft edges? I also want to think about that too. And if it's not perfect, again, at first layer, it's not the end of the world, but you do need to go back in and adjust. But you can see here how many colors that is. It's basically a tick mark exercise using only peaches and oranges and browns. It is so important that you do not ignore the highlights. A highlight has white in it, but you always have to flavor white with a little bit of another color. Otherwise, it'll be very flat and it will kind of harm your painting because it'll make it look less 3D. One thing that a lot of professionals will do, they'll take some of the pumpkin color, mix it with the background color, which is ultra blue, and then they'll purposefully kind of have a couple of flickers of paint that are outside of the pumpkin and onto the background so that's what that orange mark is for and I just knocked it down with a little bit more ultra blue but it's almost like the pumpkin itself is flickering a little bit and what this does is it takes that still life from something that's stagnant to something that is actually kind of in could be in, in motion a little bit so it's not as dead it looks more like it, it's more interesting when you do that. So just putting a couple flickers of the pumpkin color mixed with your background color and outside of the lines in your background, kind of curving it around the pumpkin, gives it a suggestion like you just glanced over there. All right, so my goal is to show you what one finished coat of paint looks like on here. And if you do have the corn cobs, they are a little harder, but it's still tick marks. It's just tiny tick marks that are curving, suggesting kernels. And it's about value and hue. So trying to match the right color, dark side versus light side, and curving your form to make it look like it's 3D. I do expect that you guys work on having soft edges in places as, along with hard edges even at the first layer and you are going to put two coats of paint on this and the second coat should have a little bit more detail and information. I'm also looking for color accuracy at that second layer stage of the painting. 